Kurt Saxon, your own poor man's James Bond. Now, this tape has weaponry and all that good stuff further on, but first, I want to show you how to become independent food-wise. That's important. Let me explain. In 1965, the Watts section of Los Angeles erupted in rioting. Courageous young black resistors defied the system and destroyed their own environment. The police and National Guard cordoned off the area as store after store was torched. The chaos went on for four days and nights. On day five, it stopped. The male men had refused to cross the battle lines to deliver welfare checks. The rioters had burned the grocery stores and were hungry. And without money to go out of the area and buy food, they had to stop. When it was over, the commercial area of Watts was a smoldering wasteland. All the young revolutionaries got for their trouble was about six TV sets apiece. In anticipation of foreign invasion or domestic tyranny, you can prevail. To assure a supply of nutritious food, forget so-called survival foods. Buy the food you normally buy, but buy the case from your supermarket manager. Canned goods keep from three to five years stored in a dry place. Aside from stocking up on canned meats, grains and beans are the cheapest, most nutritious, and longest lasting. Unopened grain bags should be safe from weevils, which are all over. But once you open the bag, transfer the grain to jars such as these, which you can get for the asking or for a slight charge from the deli section of your supermarket. If the jars don't have lids, Use plastic wrap to cover their mouths and secure with a large rubber band to keep the weevils out. At an average of $20 for 50 pounds of grain, you could store several hundred pounds of corn, wheat, rye, etc. Aside from cereal grains, you'll want 100 pounds each of mung beans, soybeans, and pinto beans. Buying them in bulk from your local health food store is much cheaper than buying them by the pound at your local grocery store. You can get them even cheaper than that from seed and feed stores, but if you do, specify that they should be untreated. I suggest bulk grains from the health food store, however, as they are guaranteed organically grown and you'll know that they don't have any weevil eggs or other trash mixed with the grain. Now I want to introduce you to sprouting. As you know, seeds are very nutritious, but when sprouted, they gain up to 600% more vitamins and minerals, which they get from the water and air. Also, they average 10 times their original bulk. Sprouts are the most nutritious vegetables and very cheap. Store sell mung beans sprouts for 68 cents for six ounces or $1.76 a pound. But if you buy 50 pounds of mung beans for $40, you can grow your own sprouts for only five and a half cents a pound. And grains and beans are sproutable for as long as five years or more. What you'll need for sprouting is wide mouth canning jars, rings, a baster, plastic trash bags, a couple of boxes, a gallon jug, and a funnel made from a plastic soft drink bottle. Any supermarket carries all these items. You also need a yard of finest mesh nylon window screen bought from any good hardware store for about $1.20. You start by making a sprouting box like this. Notice I've made a ridge so the jars can rest in a tilted position. You don't need this exact same size box, but they're pretty common. Cut into the box six inches from the top all around. Cut at each corner to the cuts on the side.
fold over and you'll have a double strength box. And if the box is the perfect size, 12 by 12 by 18 inches, even the bottom will be double thick. Next, make the ridge from a seven and a half inch piece of box as long as the sprout box. Score the ridge one and a half inches from each side and bend. Next, put a block of wood under the ridge so it won't collapse. Glue or tape the ridge down. Next, put a plastic trash bag in the box and tape it. For sprouters, use wide mouthed quart canning jars. To make the screen lids, cut and flatten a tin can and with a compass, measure a circle three and one quarter inches across. Cut this circle in the nylon screen. You can use a glue gun to secure the circles, but you can leave them loose if you like, as the rings will hold them tight. <coughs> to start, buy one pound of alfalfa seeds, a pound of mung beans, and a pound or more of hard red winter wheat. Measure one quarter ounce of alfalfa seeds, one ounce of mung beans, and four ounces of wheat and put them in the jars. Put on the lids and cover the seeds with water. Let them soak overnight. Pour out the soak water and drink it. It's vitamin and mineral rich. Sprouters are then upended and put in the box. Sprouts should be flooded four times a day but they can survive the noon period if you're away at work. However, four floodings make for faster growth. There is no waste of water in this system. The first jar is half filled and poured into the next and so on. This way, you only use two quarts of water a day. Water is then poured into the jug. This water can be used for cooking and to feed house plants. Its results are wonderful as it makes any plant thrive and could be used in organic hydroponics. When testing this system, you might want to start a batch of each of the seeds every night. And don't worry about the water that accumulates in the sprouter. Just get a baster from your grocery store and pull it right out. 
and then just put it right into the jug, and that's all there is to it. Alfalfa, the most vitaminized vegetable known, takes eight days and produces 16 times its original bulk. Your ounce of mung beans grows to six ounces in six days. After the night's soak, the four ounces of wheat double to eight ounces after two full days. Empty the jar of wheat sprouts on the second evening as wheat will mat and go woody after that. Sprouts are super enriched food. You can eat them raw or cooked. And with all the commercials nowadays about fiber and fiber-based cereals costing from 12 and a half cents to 18 cents an ounce, you can't beat sprouts at from about a cent an ounce to a cent and a half an ounce. If you're sprouting for a family, or if you're interested in sprout powder, which I'll get into next, you'll want the gallon jar. And for the cover for that, you'll use a six inch by six inch square of nylon screen, which you can hold on with a rubber band. Now, this is an example of how much alfalfa you get from one ounce in the gallon jar, and uh, that's a little over a pound for 25 cents. Now with these mung beans, you put in four ounces in the gallon jar, and so you get uh, over two pounds for about 35 cents. Now if you're growing wheat in this, you would put one pound in there, and you'd get about uh, four pounds, five pounds like that. But it does really increase your growth when you do it in the gallon jars, but for one person, the small jars are fine. If you really get into sprouting, you're going to find that you have a lot more sprouts than you can use, but that's a good thing. Then you can dry the sprouts. Now, to do that, you use a square of nylon screen, which you put in your metal screen, and because as the sprouts dry, they get crumbly and they would fall through the screen. Also, the nylon screen is a good protection for your other food against the metal tray. Now, over here, I have one small jar of wheat sprouts. That's what it looks like. And then when it's dry, it looks like this. Now, when you finish sprouting your mung beans and alfalfa, you're going to see their little holes mixed all through there. You don't need to bother washing them out. You couldn't taste them if you wanted to. Just eat them. As you work with grains and dried sprouts, you're going to need a grinder. And you can get either the steel grinder or the stone grinder for about $50 from any health food store. A lot of people believe that the stone grinder is best because they're thinking of the commercial grinders. The commercial stone grinder moves quite slow and the commercial steel grinder goes at several hundred RPMs a minute, which would generate heat and possibly devitalize the grain. But on a steel hand grinder, you're not going to generate any heat at all. And the stone grinder can't accommodate soybeans or even jerky or anything else that's at all oily. Now I'll show you how to use the grinder. And we'll start off with corn because it's the hardest to grind. And incidentally, don't bother sprouting corn because any infertile grains will just rot and spoil the batch. Now when you're grinding corn, you want to set it at a very coarse grind, which you do by simply turning that little doohickey and then turn this one just to set it for a very coarse grind. Tighten it up nice, pour in the corn, like that. Now I'll run it through again at a finer grind.
Now here it is at the finer grind and you'd want it to make it even finer than that and it might take a couple more grindings, but here's the, the way it is in successive grinders. See, this is the third grinding and this is the fourth. Now the fourth grinding is about as fine as you like it. Now once the sprouts are dried, this is what they look like. Now these are mung beans this is wheat and that's alfalfa and you'll notice they're a little brown and the reason for that is that I had a 75 watt bulb in the dryer instead of the 60 watt bulb however it's, it just sort of toasted them so that's perfectly okay now once you've got them dried you want to grind them and that's very easy you don't even need to set it to coarse grain you can make it to medium fine and I grind them all together and another thing is for when you're grinding sprouts you want to crumble them up nice so that they don't bunch up in the grinder and this way you can just they'll just grind like uh, regular wheat or something You just take a handful, throw it in there, start your grinder going, and out it comes. Now this is the most nutritious food possible. It has everything you need. It's a perfect survival food. It will store indefinitely. And uh, here's a whole pound of it, which you get for less than 50 cents a pound. So you just can't beat this process. Now that I've got your food conscious, I'd like to urge you to order Survivor Volume 1. It has a large section on foods which are very nourishing and cheap and will relieve all your anxieties about food for the future. Now I'll introduce you to my favorite bread, which is a combination of one-third corn, one-third rye, and one-third whole wheat. This is very nutritious, very tasty, and it's also very cheap since it only costs about 18 and a half cents a pound. And you can buy the flour already ground in the health food store, and it's even cheaper if you grind it yourself. Now I'm going to show you how I make my super pancakes. First, measure four ounces of each flour and combine in a bowl. Then add a teaspoonful of salt and mix the dry ingredients. Then add a cup and a half of water and mix well. Then add an egg and another cup and a half of water and mix until smooth. When you've got your skillet greased and hot, then add the baking powder and mix it in pretty quick. And then 
you start pouring. When the bubbles that form start closing up, like you see now, they're ready to turn. Just flip them over and count 25 before you take them out and they're done. Now with this recipe, you should get about nine, six inch across pancakes. Now I like to spread mine with margarine and use salt and pepper, but you can use uh, sweetness if you're into that. But the, the nice thing about these pancakes is that for 18 and a half cents a pound or 44 cents for a batch of two and a half pounds, uh, you can't beat this kind of bread. And you just think about that next time you buy bread at the store. Now I'll tell you how to make a very cheap and extremely efficient food dryer. Now what I did for this, I found a box that was one foot by one foot by one foot by one foot. And uh, you can either find one or make one. It's not hard to put a box together. And I had pretty wide flaps so that I can close everything over on itself and it will shut. But you don't want to shut it too tight because then it'll, the moisture can't get out. But anyway, you do up the sides with the duct tape, as it's shown here. And inside the box, you put another uh, rim of cardboard around about eight inches from the bottom. Now, here's your 100-watt light bulb. And on the bottom is uh, the aluminum foil. And under the aluminum foil, held by, uh, with duct tape, is a regular ceramic light socket, but not with the pull chain, but where they, you simply put the wires in there and hook it up. And the wires come out here, just like that. And as I said, it's extremely simple, and it works very well. Now, now to make your uh, trays, you get uh, one yard of uh, what they call hardware cloth, which is actually one quarter inch mesh uh, screen galvanized. And the galvanized uh, protects it and you can use it to dry meats and vegetables, except if you're using anything with acid in it, then uh, you should spray this with some sort of plastic coating because the acid will eat the galvanized material off. And if you're not uh, drying tomatoes, and I don't see why anybody would because it's just all water, then uh, you shouldn't have to treat it anymore at any time. Now, this wire gets cut about 10 and a half inches on each side and uh, with about one and a half inch on the side where you'll bend it up and then about a quarter of an inch where you bend it over. This way it makes it so that the trays nest on one another. And then, when you've got your trays full of meat or whatever, then you just put them down in there and they rest on that cardboard, like that, and you, two or three are fine. And then when you've got them in there, you just take and you close the box up, like so, and you put something on it. Now the box is closed, but it's not closed so tight that it wouldn't get the proper ventilation. Now this dryer cost me less than $10 to make and in one afternoon, and probably most of the stuff you have around your own home. 
and it's uh, I think it's better than the manufactured models that I've seen but the process of uh, preserving foods and especially beef jerky and uh, building this unit here are all detailed a whole lot better in uh, Survivor Volume 3. People have been drying meat for thousands of years. It's the simplest way to prepare it. It's the best way to store it. It also makes it very tasty and it's a lot more nutritious from cooked meat. Now, all we're doing today is the, the beef has been cut up and in one quarter thick slices and put in marinade. Now, marinade is for tenderizing and flavoring and it just has uh, four tablespoons of soy sauce, two tablespoons of liquid smoke, two teaspoons of salt, uh, one teaspoonful of red pepper, and two-thirds of a cup of water. You put it in the bowl, mix it up, and you put your beef in there, or your mutton, or your deer, or whatever, and uh, you let it soak in there for a half hour or overnight. It doesn't matter how long you do it, just so it's, it's got the uh, action. And then you take the pieces and you lay them out on the uh, tray just so they don't touch each other and also you want to make sure that you don't lay it directly over the center because the light bulb is down there and uh, the reason you don't want to do that is because the uh, beef or whatever drips and you'll just drip it all over your light bulb and you don't want to do that but uh, basically this is all in the world there is to doing it and then when you have it uh, in there, you check it about every three hours, and maybe you turn it over, maybe you switch the top tray to the bottom tray and so on like that, just so it's all evenly done. And uh, it, it'll be done in from uh, six to 10 hours, something like that. But since a 100 watt bulb only costs 10 cents for 24 hours, at least in Arkansas, it, it's not going to uh, be an expense. And then when you're all done with it, what you'll have is very tasty, actually delicious beef jerky, much better than what you can buy in the store because this doesn't have any preservatives like they have to use. And you can use this for camping. Uh, just Now, if you're going to store it, you've got to make sure that it's dry and then you put it in plastic baggies and seal it real nice. And it should stay that way indefinitely. You ought to test it maybe about every couple of months and if it's not if it's starting to spoil or get a mold on it just put it back in the dryer and that'll kill all the mold now the principle of thermos jug cookery is the same as the old fireless cookery and that's where you put your food and the water it's to be cooked in in a pan and get it to the boiling point and then you put it in the thermos jug and then overnight the uh, nearly boiling water will cook whatever you put in there it doesn't cook beans for instance and it won't cook corn but it will cook wheat rye basically uh, just about anything else you can think of even meat and a thing that you've got to figure out first when you first get your thermos jug is to put the wheat and whatever you intend to cook on a steady basis and fill up the uh, thermos jug to the point uh, to allow for the cap and then you <clears throat> pour it out into the pan and you sort of mark the pan so that you know from then on how much to, to put in the pan so because you don't want to uh, overfill it you don't want anything left out and this way after a while it will be just second nature to do it without any measuring or anything and of course, then you put in the four ounces of wheat and you stir it. And to put the uh, food into the thermos, what you need is a funnel. And what I use for a funnel and what you can make too is simply the top of a one gallon milk carton cut off that makes a very good funnel and you need a funnel because you're not going to have time 
to lift it out and spoon and everything like that because you don't want your water to get uh, any cooler. So also you need to add some salt, otherwise it'll taste very bland. And you can put as much as you like. And of course you can put uh, peppers or whatever you like to flavor it, unless you want it as a breakfast food to be served with uh, milk and sweetening. Now it's just about to boil now. See, it doesn't take long. This is all the energy you're going to use to cook it, whereas it would take about two and a half hours on the stove to cook uh, wheat. And if you had several of these thermos jugs, when the brownouts come, then uh, you could cook all of your meals with just about five minutes of power, like if you had all the burners going. Now, as you can see, it's boiling merrily. And what we do next is we just turn off the energy, lift it up there, pour it in the funnel as quickly as you can with safety. And if there are any grains in there, just scrape them out. Then force that down through there. Put on the stopper nice and tight. Shake it up a little bit. Lay it on its side because you don't want it to clog at the bottom. And then you're ready to go the next morning. And that's really all there is to it. Some of you are right that regardless of all the information in the poor man's James Bond, you still have difficulty getting bomb components. Well, bless your heart, Clyde, anyone can make a bomb. You can make one by using odds and ends available even during an enemy occupation. Now, you start with a carton of book matches and cut off the head. tedious work for one, but an evening's fun for the family if you can drag them away from the TV. The next step is to process the match heads for fuses. Put the match heads in a cup and fill it halfway with boiling water. and in a few seconds the paper will be separated and floating on top. Then pour the contents through a screen and into a bowl. Discard the paper from the heads and evaporate most of the liquid. When it's down to a thin mush, like this, it's time to make your fuses. For the fuses, you cut about 20 10-inch lengths of medium-sized cotton twine. Next, provide a metal surface like a baking pan. Then put lengths of twine in the well-stirred mush one at a time and slosh them around. You might add a quarter teaspoon of mucilage glue to the mixture for sticking power. When they are well soaked and coated, take a pair of tweezers and pull the fuse out by an end. Next, gently scrape down the fuse to remove clots and any excess mush. Then lay the fuse on the metal surface.
When your fuses are nicely laid out, put them in a 200 degree oven for about 20 minutes. If you don't have an oven, use your food dryer or else set them outside in the sun. When dry, release the fuses by running a razor knife or other sharp blade underneath them. These fuses should not go out, but don't bend them or handle them any more than necessary. Now for the detonators. Get some one half or five eighth inch PVC tubings and some caps like these from your hardware store. Cut the tubing into three and a half and four and a half inch lengths. Drill a one eighth inch hole in one of the two caps. To make sure the caps will go on all the way, put them on first without glue and mark around them with a pencil. That way, when putting them on for good, you'll know they're all the way on if they reach the lines. The heads from one carton of book matches we'll fill six three and a half inch tubes. Here we have your match heads, a fuse, your three and a half inch detonator tube and caps drilled and undrilled and the four and a half inch tube and milk jug cap. Now to make the detonator. You first take a fuse and put one end through the hole in the top of the cap. Now you might have to moisten the fuse and twist the end to make it go through. Pull the fuse three and a half inches through. Then spread super glue around the top and sides of the tube. Push the fuse in the tube and force the cap down to the line. Next, pour in the match heads. Trick the tube frequently to make the heads settle in place and make room for as many heads as the tube will hold. Then super glue on the bottom cap. For my demonstrator detonators, I used a heavy expanded steel screen to catch the fragments to see how they shattered. Many of the pieces ripped right through the screen, as you can see. These are the fragments of the PBC tubing showing what 160 match heads will do. So these detonators are not firecrackers or any kind of toy. They are powerful small bombs and can injure and even kill. Before attaching the top tube to the detonator, cut a hole through a milk carton cap and press it about an inch down the tube. 
The main consideration is to ensure that the tube surrounding the fuse coming out of the detonator is sealed to keep the gasoline out. The best method is a four and a half inch length of PVC tubing glued to the detonator cap with a glue gun. Start the gluing by putting a line of glue around the tube's end and pressing it to the detonator cap. Glue guns cost about $10 and have so many uses you should not be without one. When it's set, put a layer of glue around the whole cap and up the tube about an inch. You might also put a ring of glue around the bottom cap. Gasoline is very volatile and will go through thin plastic or plastic tape in seconds. The thick layer from the glue gun, however, will give you the seal you need since the detonator won't be in the gasoline for more than a minute before it goes off. When the detonator is completed and just before you're going to use it, fill the milk jug with gasoline to the curve. To arm it, you simply take off the cap, put the detonator in, screw it nice, then light it and run like crazy because you don't have a lot of time. And now for the fame. There are two designs, but first, the poison, nicotine. Buy a box of Copenhagen or Skoll and dump it in a cup. Then put in two ounces of rubbing alcohol and let it set overnight. The alcohol keeps the nicotine from breaking down. Then pour the mess into a piece of cloth. Next, twist it until no more liquid comes out. This is a lethal poison and only a few drops in the bloodstream is fatal. The perfect delivery system for liquid poisons is the fang, of which there are two models as you've seen. This first being the pocket model. As you can see, the components are simple. There is first a hypodermic syringe and needle. The top of the syringe is cut off as is the edge of the end of the plunger. A one and one half inch strip of plastic tape is folded over and a hole is punched. This tab is put on and a number 18 gauge needle is then twisted on. A one-eighth inch slice of a half inch dowel is then glued to the end of the plunger. And glued around and pushed into a three and eleven sixteenths inch piece of five eighths inch PVC tubing. The end of the tubing is ground to aid in putting on the cap. The cap is a 12 inch by 3 inch length of common paper tape. But first, 
glue a two inch length of paper tape around the tube so the rolled cap will fit the painted tube. Then a 1 8 inch slice of 5 8 inch dowel is glued and shoved in the end. After painting the tube, a 1 quarter inch wide by 8 inch length of plastic tape is wrapped around the tube one and one eighth inches from the front end. This keeps the cap from touching the needle's tip. To load, the needle's tip is put into the poison and the tab is held between the thumb and forefinger. The tube is then pulled back until the front end of the syringe is visible. This ensures one cc of poison in the syringe. If properly made, the cap should be tight enough to stay on the tube but loose enough to stay in the pocket when the fang is withdrawn from the cap. Might sew a seam down the side of the pocket which will hold the cap while the fang is being withdrawn. To use, just jab the needle into any fleshy part of the body. Now for lack of a Russian, I'll use this box. As soon as the thrust is completed, the fang is withdrawn and put into a side pocket without bothering about the cap. Depending on where the thrust hits your opponent, he should be down in about five seconds. In this short time, he won't be able to react or even to let anyone know he's been attacked. If you want a fang but don't feel up to making one, you can buy one from me for $15. Now we come to the super fang. It's not as compact as the original, but it's what you need when you really want to reach out and touch someone. Its extra length will make your attack less noticeable. For instance, say you're in a bar standing beside two Russians. Your super fang is tucked in your belt or in your sock. You take it out, arm it, reach around the first Russian, and thrust it into the nether quarters of the furthest Russian. If your victim is as hardy as Russians are purported to be, he may have time to clobber his comrade. Then his comrade would clobber him just as his knees were buckling. It would be obvious that one Russian killed the other, so you would have killed two birds with one stone, as it were. I'm sure you can come up with many ideas of how to make the extra length come in handy. And don't discount the flat black finish which makes it nearly invisible in dim light. The super fang has two different locking mechanisms to keep the needle in place both at rest and when armed. This first is less complicated but not so handy as the user must look at it in order to prepare it for use. This might necessitate going to the john to arm the weapon. Even so, in most cases, this should present no problem. This basic super fang is composed of a piece of 5 8 inch PVC tubing exactly 11 and 3 8 inches long. A 1 8 inch hole is drilled 7 16 of an inch from the end. The action consists of a 7 and 7 8 inch length of 3 8 inch dowel. Two 1 8 inch holes are drilled into one end, the first a half inch from the end and the second 1 and 7 8 of an inch from the first. One end of the dowel is notched to give greater surface to the glue between the dowel and the hypo's plunger. The flat end of the plunger is cut around so there is no part wider than the dowel. A glue gun is best to attach the dowel to the plunger. 
the PVC tube and the dowel are painted with a non-reflective flat black. This makes the weapon hard to see in dim light. A black glove would conceal your hand so that in reaching out, no one would notice your arm, hand, or super fang. Finger hold is cut off the body of the hypo to make it fit easily into the PVC tubing. After one cc of poison is drawn into the hypo, a peg is pushed through the tube's hole and into the second hole in the dowel. This fits snugly and keeps the needle from sticking the operator. To arm the super fang, the peg is removed, the large dowel is pushed forward flush with the tube, and the peg reinserted. To leave the needle exposed is to take the chance of sticking yourself when you put the fang back into your belt or sock. So be sure to return the dowel to the unarmed position. Now for a word about the needles themselves. Unlike needles for people, these are number 18s for livestock and are much stronger and will go through any clothing without bending. They can be bought at just about any farm supply store. If you can't get them, I sell them for a dollar a set. My preference is this next model. The peg is glued into the single hole in the dowel, which is only six and one-eighth inches long. Instead of the single hole in the PVC tubing, a router is used to make a two and one-fourth inch slit with one notch at the bottom and another one a half inch from the end. To use, flip the peg out of the end notch, slide it down to the bottom and into the other notch. You don't want the slide area too loose as that might cause it to arm itself. If yours is too loose, simply give that area the necessary number of coats of paint to make it tighter. Either super fang is relatively easy to make if you have all the materials at hand. Again, if you don't feel up to it, I'll sell the more sophisticated slide model for $20. Now I'll demonstrate the hydrochloric acid goodie. This isn't really dangerous since one whiff will make anyone run for an exit, but it is fun and will clear a room if panic is desired. Hydrochloric acid, also called muriatic acid, is common swimming pool acid and is bought cheaply in most supermarkets in areas where there are swimming pools. It is also used for cleaning grouting off newly laid tile and so it is sold by most hardware stores. It is best used with chunks of aluminum from cans or tubing. Simply fill a can half full of aluminum and pour in about a half pint of hydrochloric acid. The beauty of the hydrochloric acid goodie is that it acts upon aluminum to produce great clouds of dark, thick, choking fumes. For clearing out rooms or even among crowds outside, it's a real gas. The beauty of the hydrochloric acid goodie is that it acts upon aluminum to produce great clouds of dark, thick, choking fumes. For clearing out rooms or even among crowds outside, it's a real gas. This is guaranteed to clear any room, theater, or bar. The nice thing about this is that you have nearly a full minute to get to clear the area before it starts working. The hydrochloric acid goodie can also be used as a noise bomb. It isn't very dangerous, but it goes off with a bang that will make people think WW3 has started. Simply cut up two aluminum soft drink cans and put them in a two liter plastic pop bottle. Pour in about a half a pint of hydrochloric acid and screw the cap on tightly. You have about 45 seconds before the acid reacts with the aluminum 
and up to three or four minutes before the pressure builds up enough to explode the bottle. As you do these projects, don't consider me as any final authority. I've tried to simplify everything, but I hope you can simplify them even more. I've developed my talent for improvising through my study of 19th and early 20th century science and technology. You can too. Just buy the survivors in the Poor Man's James Bond series and you'll be fascinated by all the clever gadgets and processes worked out by people just like us. So have as much fun as you can with these projects until you get tape number three.